Where to begin? Uh, Strike just finished its fourth season. It's a British TV show, a mystery crime detective show. You've got the main character, Cormoran Strike. Cormoran is not an American name, so yeah, I mean, it's yeah. going to take a while just to say his name correctly. Then you also have Robin Ellicott, who plays his assistant. Uh, she's also sort of a detective in, in training. Um, at the beginning of the first episode, because I watched all four of this season, Cormoran Strike is at the wedding of Robin Ellicott, and she is marrying Matt, her boyfriend from college, mm -hmm. and he is an accountant, and he is a douchebag. But mm -hmm. we'll get into that. So I watched all four episodes, and this series was based on a series of novels written by Robert Galbraith. Mm -hmm. And from what you told me, uh, that is actually a code name for... Yep, uh, J.K. Rowling. Robert Galbraith does not exist. <laughs> yeah, it's a pen name. And yeah, pseudonym, yep. It was written after the Harry Potter series? Yep. And in fact, it's still an ongoing uh, book, so much so that the fifth book, Troubled Blood, is released tomorrow. Oh, okay. Just so before wonder, it, they started filming the fifth season. Yeah, I wonder if that was like on purpose or not, but I couldn't get an answer. Well, are the books progressively longer? Because this was the yes. longest season. Yeah, they are. Uh, and I was surprised to see that this one, um, Lethal White, that's what the series name is and what the book's name is, is the most acclaimed, but also the longest one. I believe it's 656 pages long. Okay, so they had to cram all that into four hours of television. Yeah, and usually with these uh, books, they follow someone who has either gone missing or someone who has died. For example, in season one, it follows a supermodel's supposed suicide. In season two, it follows an author who disappeared during a uh, release of his book. In season three, it was tracking a murderer. And in season four, it's also tracking a murderer, I believe. You're tracking a lot of things in season four. Uh, tell me a little bit about these characters. So you got Cormoran Strike, who I know he doesn't have a leg. Like, he lost one of his legs in the war? In Afghan war, yep. Okay, and then he's an ex-detective, and he decided to just open his own PI firm? Yeah, well, he, in the first three seasons, he's just a regular PI, but then season four, he decides to leave and open his own firm, and I believe that you start to see kind of the development of that in this, uh, in this season. Yeah, so let's go episode by episode. The first episode, I'll give a little bit of a synopsis for. You got Cormoran, right? He's at the big estate wedding, which kind of reminded me of a Sherlock or the show Lovesick, because both of them used an estate wedding where these people just had giant mansions out in the nowhere, <laughs> and uh, you'd have a bunch of friends who'd show up. And so we get Cormoran kind of crashing this, and then him and his assistant kind of staring at each other throughout the entire thing. I don't know if it's at this point kind of a misconnections, moonlighting, like Fox and Scully, will they, won't they type deal. Yeah, no, it 100% is. Yeah, so when he interrupts everything to say, you should come back and work for me, I assume that something happened in the third season where it ended with her leaving for some reason because she was getting married. But yeah, then there was a year later jump. Like, we get a full jump. She's married. She's agreed to go back to work. And we get the view of the PI office that they work at, which is pretty modest in size. It looks a little bit like Matt Murdock, Jessica Jones. Do you remember their PI yeah. or detective agencies? And then you got Cormoran, who's now dating this lady named Lorelai, who we learned throughout the episodes really likes him, but he's so-so with her. She's a really nice lady. Um, but then we get Billy Knight, and that's where the story begins. You get this sort of mangy manic dude who's running through the streets at night, and he scrapes a sign into the wall like of the actual PI uh, room he breaks into the office yeah. and it looks like a prehistoric dead horse and he's acting all schizo and stuff he waits until Cormoran and uh, his assistant show up the next day uh, he's got blood on his hand and he says something along the lines of I saw a strangulation of this young girl when I was like six years old and strike immediately takes the case <laughs> <laughs> And that tracks with the novels. Like, they do try to keep very, very close to the actual events in the The source books. material. Yeah. Well, J.K. Rowling is an executive producer, so I assume that in order to even get it on the page, that they need to... The script page. Yeah, I assume they so. They need to get yeah. past her. Yeah, so we get Billy Knight still, and he's haunted by these images of this girl's death, uh, even though he's a druggie or whatever. And uh, his the secretary, not the assistant, but the secretary of uh, Cormoran walks in, she sees Billy, freaks out, says, I want to get paid for this whole day, but I'm not coming back. 
and then she leaves. <laughs> and I don't think we see her for the rest of the series. Or if we do, it's so small that like it doesn't matter. I honestly So that was like her character's exit basically. Maybe. Like it just seems so off like it went from serious to comedy in mm-hmm. a split yeah. second. Yeah. So Strike uses his credit card because by this point the scene's done. He goes out, he finds an address that Billy has given him. He uses a credit card to pop the lock, which didn't look particularly convincing, but once he gets in there, uh, he sees that the house is kind of in a ramshackled state. It looks like other people have been living there. Uh, And then he finds a flyer for this thing that's like asking for revolution. And he's like, perfect. And so he goes to the pub where he sees Jimmy Knight and it ends up being Billy's brother. And he's going off on a tirade about capitalism and how much it sucks. Yeah, in in the uh, books, his brother uh, is like a left-wing activist, like radical left, I think. Yeah, I mean, he does events throughout the series that make it very obvious that he's uh, not just for a protest, but he's also actively engaged in, like, he'd be an Antifa person. Yeah. Yeah, but he play, he's played by a guy who looks like a young Johnny Lee Miller, and uh, once he's spouted off to enough people at the bar, uh, Strike tries to cozy on up to him. Um, they try to make Jimmy's character cool and dangerous and be like, <laughs> but yeah. I, meh. Edgy, yeah. <laughs> I mean, and then, so then we get a flash to Robin's character and she's having panic attacks that she's not telling anybody about at work. And she's been dealing with it by seeing a shrink and it's basically anxiety over a rape that happened to her. And I don't know if the rape happened to her in the first three seasons or if it was... Yeah, the rape happened in the third season. It was also a thing that happened in the books, but it did get some controversy over the fact that, you know, like it was revealed. Was it represented in the actual... No, it, it was revealed. So, like, you didn't see it, but it... Oh, okay, so that's where the controversy mm-hmm. was. Well, throughout the episodes, she does have plenty of panic attacks, and it does undermine her going undercover Mm -hmm. because it'll hit her at any time when anything can stick very unexpected yeah Yeah, and she's trying to keep it a secret at the same time which isn't smart when we finally get a understanding of matthew's character her new husband we kind of see him as just kind of a dick uh she regrets her marriage you can tell that he never really redeems himself throughout the series uh he keeps on putting her down gaslighting her being jealous and Honestly, like I was like, is this going to be the killer? Because <laughs> they represented him, and I just wanted to punch the guy in the face. Yeah, he's like that in the books as well. Yeah, why'd she marry him? I just, Okay, we'll get into that. That's episode three. Um, so this guy named Jasper Chisel hires uh, Cormoran. Um, he's a government minister, and Strike actually investigated his son Freddy's death, and Cormoran later on reveals to Robin that Freddy is just a terrible person. And uh, it was good that he was dead, basically. Um, Not a lot of sympathy. Yeah. yeah. So Jasper, the old guy, is being blackmailed, but he can't go to the cops. And he wants to hire a strike over the stuffy, stuffy lunch that they have to find dirt on his blackmailers. Mm-hmm. And, and they don't say what he's being blackmailed for, right? Like, Not at the start, but it's found out throughout the series. The one thing I don't like is that they say that he's being blackmailed, we find out for like, forty thousand dollars or so Mm -hmm. that's That's not not, a lot of money money. (laughs) especially for this dude he has his own club where he's like throwing his own lunch to hire this guy i'm sure that he'd end up paying this guy more than forty thousand. rich and powerful so it's like that's it's almost like the docker evil one million dollars joke that they make in austin powers where it's like he says one million dollars and all the people laugh because that's easy to pay yeah later on he dies and we have to figure out who murdered him and Almost everyone is saying who knows about the blackmail was just like, yeah, I told him to pay it off, but he didn't want to. (laughs) It's just like, what are you doing, bro? So then Stryker goes off. He knows two names of the people who are blackmailing the dude. One is Jimmy Knight, who he's already met. And the other is this Garrett Winford guy. And so he sends Robin to pose as the goddaughter of Jasper uh, to go bug the office of Garrett Winford. And she goes in there and... Grant has a wife that's blind and he and her run an agency or a charity for disabled people. And so he's very tied up in that in the government. And uh, their daughter, we learn, died tragically in a suicide that she committed. And we know that there's a connection between that and what's going on here, but we're not sure what yet. So Cormoran also hires his ex-friend or his friend who was like an ex-detective as well over a pint to follow Jimmy Knight. So he's basically 
just pushing off the work that he's supposed to do himself right, yeah. to another guy. But that story felt really underdeveloped. Um, I feel like there's probably more of it in the actual. Speaking book. of which, how, is this like a 40 minute show? How, how long is it? It's like 15 minutes each episode. Okay. Yeah. So then we learn uh, that Jasper has a few kids besides Freddy that are still alive. You have Izzy, who's a daughter who works with her father. You have Raphael, who is kind of the black sheep of the family at this mm-hmm. point. The dad no longer likes him. He's kind of ridden him out of his will. He considers him a lesser version of Freddy. And, uh, but Raphael comes across really nice and he's like immediately starts talking about the one bad thing in his life, which was a drunk driving incident when he was a kid. Yeah. So we're supposed to like him and he doesn't, sort of looks like Peter from uh, Counterpart. Something tragic happens though, right? Like he doesn't end up killing a lady um, in the drunk driving incident. Yeah, he did kill some lady, but then he got out of it um, because of his family connections and he feels terrible about it. That's what we're told. And then uh, so Strike tracks down another address that takes him to a field that was like owned by the Chisel family, the Jasper Chisel family, and etched in the grass, like giant signs type of way, yeah. is uh, again that same symbol of the horse right, yeah. that, uh, the, that Billy was riding on. Mm-hmm. So at this point, it's really late. Robin and Cormoran go up to the boarded cottage because they remember in uh, Billy's story that he said that the body was the body of the strangled girl was behind it. So they find it. They go and they see the grave down this hole. Robin goes down there because he can't because he can't move too well with his leg. Like, yeah. And uh, she does like two scoops and finds like <laughs> the pink uh, flag or whatever that she was buried in. And he, she's like, I see bones. And that's where we cut off the first episode. And so we're like, okay, that's a slam dunk. We found a dead girl. Now we just have to blame the guy. So, <laughs> yeah, that's where we have to end off on the first episode. And then in the second episode, we start off with dogs chasing them away from that area oh, that they, they just, just found. Released on them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And honestly, I don't know why they didn't call the cops as soon as they found the grave. They instead decided to start digging it up themselves, which would obviously impede the evidence. Got to keep the suspension, yeah. You'd think that they would handle it differently. Uh, And as far as my thinking about the first episode, I didn't really think it was that good a show. It didn't really have anything that was super enticing. It didn't really engage you. Because I know it, yeah. it's it's shown on Cinemax in the U.S. and like I know with Cinemax, the only real thing I saw was Banshee, and that whole entire show was just about engaging the viewer, even just throwing in crazy action scenes and stuff. Yeah, like but that. I mean, it felt like an Endeavor or Father Brown or any of the other like millions of shows out there that follow detectives through murders. Right. Yeah. All right. So the second episode, we it doesn't get much better. Um, it's more of an info dump of an episode. You get the dogs moving them away from the grave. Then you find out that Jimmy was the ex-dealer of the Chisel Kids. So you're finding more connections between the Knights and the Chisels. Mm -hmm. And then uh, Chisel is still their client, technically, because he's supposed to be getting the blackmailing and blackmail the blackmailers. But he's also a suspect over this grave that they found in the back. Mm -hmm. Um, Then you find out more about Freddy. Like, he liked humiliating women. He was a fencer. And Rihanna... The dead, or the dead girl who committed suicide um, from the Wynn family, she uh, she was at the party that Freddie had thrown during his 18th birthday. Okay. All right. So then, at one of these anti-capitalism protests uh, that's taking place at a broken-down warehouse, uh, you got Strike trying to find Billy, who again is Jimmy's brother, but he's been missing since that first meeting where he was acting so frantic. And uh, he finds him in a boarded up room upstairs and Billy kind of parkours off the roof in like a (laughs) jumping thing. Like cricket from It's Always Sunny. Yeah, exactly. So Billy and Jimmy are still on the loose and then they get some luck in finding some dirt on the guy who's running the charity, the other blackmailer, Garant. Um, They kept on pronouncing his name differently. I'm just going to call him Garant. Um, He's actually been taking money from the charity to pay for other things and he never returned the loan yet. And so that's something that will be held over him by Jasper to stop him from blackmailing him further. Uh, We also have a bunch of Jimmy's minions who try to sabotage this event that Chisel's going to be at. And they try to like attack him, which doesn't make sense because they're blackmailing. Jimmy is blackmailing Chisel for money. So why is he so trying to kill him? Exactly, like, yeah. Or at least maim him or do something. It's, it just seemed really weird. It seems like a lot of the characters' goals didn't really make a lot of sense. 
Well, you could tell that Jimmy was ultra just trying to get his money. You could tell that Winford probably had some sort of moral thing that he was going for. Like he was really pissed off about his daughter dying and that there was some connection there that we still hadn't found out. They seem to sort of ignore the grave thing besides just saying that the police went, checked out the grave and nothing came of it. Like they don't know what happened there, but it doesn't seem like it was a big deal after all. So a lot of stuff just ends up not being a huge deal, but we'll swing back to that one later. Uh, we do meet Charlotte, who is uh, Strikes X, and I assume she's also been in earlier parts of the Caesar series because she really plays no role in this storyline. I feel like she was just there to draw a connection throughout yeah, the world. basically. Yeah. But yeah, she asks to get back together with him, and it spends him on a, like a... He, he tailspins because of it. Mm-hmm. Uh, but besides that, like... That's, that's all of it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, that's a lot of what the show has been kind of criticized for. It, they say that, like... It's good, but it focuses too much on the will they, won't they aspect, and like not enough on like the well, cool kind will of will they, will, won't they is Robin, not yeah. Charlotte. But, but I'm saying yeah. like they throw things into that storyline just yeah, to there kind are of multiple like multiple relationships. The yeah. only one that I'm okay with actually is Robin and Matt because of the way that ends up, and I'll explain that in the next episode. Last things that happen in this episode is Billy calls and sounds like he's about to die. He's like, I'm sorry, blah, 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 or something. Um, And you can clearly hear a carnival, like, merry-go-round music in the background. And I'm just like, how obvious do you have to be, television show? Uh, And so Cormoran immediately finds him outside of a merry-go-round. And uh, he's been stabbed. I think he did it to himself. So he goes to the hospital. And at the same time, we see that Chisel is dead. Chisel has been asphyxiated by someone pulling a, like, uh, plastic bag over his face and it's been staged to look like a suicide but it's clear that someone had them had him killed i haven't read the books but it seemed like from the summaries that i was reading that chisel's death like was kind of the main force of the show so i'm surprised For the next two episodes which do get better because i do like the last two episodes i was not a fan of the first two it does guide that mm-hmm. up until then it didn't really feel like we were watching a story for anything because it didn't feel like we were really getting any conclusion to the girl who had been strangled in billy's idea of a nightmare and we didn't really know what was going on with chisel why he wouldn't just pay off his blackmailers once he died it actually gave us a sort of a what's the word uh knives out type of deal yeah, and i'll, yeah. I'll get, get into that so in the third episode we jump two weeks right yep and Izzy's there. That's one of the kids. We got Robin and Strike who are kind of interviewing the family. They're all in the mansion. Uh, Izzy has paid their bill for their work thus far, which was nice of her. She's probably the nicest of all the kids. Um, and she tells them that the grave behind the house that they had found, or this cottage, was actually a pony grave. That it was a young pony that had been murdered by Freddy at one point. Wow. Because yeah. Freddy is <laughs> just is a, awful. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so they go to the estate and they're there and we find out that there were only three keys to get into Chisel's apartment at the time that he died. One of them was owned by the stepmom, Kim Vara, who everyone suspects the entire time. So much so that it feels like it would be a cop out to say that she actually did it. Mm-hmm. You had one of them being the Polish housekeeper who had a key, but then she suddenly stopped appearing at work a few weeks earlier and hadn't been seen since uh and then you had the dead guy so i don't think yeah, he, he did it him. yeah um so the trophy wife uh, kim vara she basically has an alibi that clears her of anything she's been on cctv footage during the time of the death and no one can suspect her of foul play however everybody says she had a part in it still uh, Billy is stable, but he's not seen anyone at the hospital because he, they're not family. They can't really get into him. Um, and then in exchange for the police report on Chisel's death, Van, um, Vanessa, this cop that Robin knows, they like give information to one another. And I guess it was like an equal trade. We learned before the guy suffocated that he actually had sleeping pills in his body uh, over the orange juice that he had drank earlier in the day. And he always drinks orange juice. Um, then we find out that Jimmy's girlfriend spoke Polish and that she, there was a conversation that Strike had had with her about her being a, or that he had overheard of her cleaning toilets. Mm-hmm. So they were like, oh, she's the person who was working as the maid. She may have had a key card. However, um, when they look 
deeper and by looking deeper i mean robin goes under undercover again as a goth girl to hang out with jimmy's <laughs> girlfriend as you and do. <laughs> she immediately gets an in and gets invited to the party and the girlfriend is telling her about all of jimmy's misdeeds and how she has like proof of him doing something wrong that she's written down but she won't tell robin where robin finds that regardless and when that happens at the party, Jimmy and his gang all find out because Robin gives her real name because she's having a panic attack or something. And they chase her. And right when it seems like they're going to catch her, uh, Jimmy gets pulled over by the cops. We also have a few tailing storylines where you have Strike's girlfriend, Lorelai, confessing that she loves Strike. And he kind of just doesn't reciprocate. Yeah, yeah. He just kind of ignores her until she dumps him. And it's it's just awkward to watch. He also confronts Winford's assistant to find out why he's been acting so suspicious and what he's, his whole thing is in this. He comes out with a butter knife. He tries to threaten Strike, <laughs> but it doesn't really work out very well. We find out that Rihanna, the daughter who killed herself, uh, Freddie was more involved in that than we thought beforehand. Like sh- He played a big role in bullying her all the time. Uh, so they definitely have a reason, the Winfords, for wanting Chisel dead. But the more we learn about it, the less it actually seems like they had any part in it. Man. But the episode really hits its stride at the very end when Robin finds out that Matt has been cheating on her the entire time. She confronts him at the house saying Sarah left her earring here last time. And she finally is breaking up with this, like, pathetic piece of shit because Matt immediately starts insulting her, saying she's nothing, that she looks bad for flaking out on university and then only getting the job back because Strike feels bad for her. And then he blocks her from leaving. Like, it looks like she... Yeah, yeah, he gets really in her face. And uh, he's like, you look like a mess. You're shaking. And (laughs) And then she comes back with a really good line, I think, which was like... I would never have married you if I hadn't been raped because it was like just showed that she was had no, no love for him whatsoever at that point. And it was simply her own survival instinct, which had originally had her tied to him. And she had tried to get out of it several times. Like they showed him her on her honeymoon trying to break up with him and he got stung by a jellyfish or something. So <laughs> so it was like a bad time to do it. But uh, I don't know how they lasted a year. I'm glad he was out of her life. She uh, she went into the car and drove away and uh, we never see him again. Well, what I'm interested in is if he's going to come back in the fifth book because he does leave in the fourth book. It sounds like they followed that pretty similarly, but he was in the first three. So I'm wondering. I hope not because the way they concluded things, even the mom's character of Robin was a big fan of matt and that just showed how much like she had to get get away from him because she just couldn't she couldn't get around people who weren't just constantly trying to reinforce that marriage right yeah yeah so then the fourth episode follows the same knives out track because we start off with a date between robin and Raphael, jasper's kid Mm -hmm. one of the suspects obviously he has lived in freddie's shadow the entire time he was uh written out of his father's will and then he kind of just discloses Freddy was a monster. He victimized uh, Brianna Wynn, who then we know killed herself mm-hmm. by like forcing her to like drink. And then he took pictures and he oh, spread those yeah. pictures around the internet. It was it was bad news for that. Uh, so then Jimmy is questioned by the cops because he's been arrested for trying to, I guess, chase down uh, Robin at that one party. And uh, he's acting really confident and he's giving them the runaround they want to know if kim and the, him are working together the uh trophy wife lady <laughs> and uh her alibi is that she's on a ton of footage right right yeah but when they actually look at the cctv footage she's on a, like so much of it it's beyond suspect because she's like trying to be seen which mm-hmm. reminds me of a scene from outsiders which was the um i think the hbo or apple series uh that followed a stephen king book and had uh, Jason Bateman, mm-hmm. um, and there was a character who always wanted to be looked at in the CCTV so that later on he could be, like, free of any right, charges, yeah. you know? But this character actually wanted to be caught, so mm-hmm. it was it was weird. But in this version, Kim's character is seen giving this homeless person a, a, a money, but Strike realizes he she may actually be giving him the key card 
that she had later on in the night that proved that she couldn't have been it couldn't have been used to access the right, house. Yeah. But if she gave him the key card, he went to the house and then he was able to slip it back to her before she got to the house again, then that could be her the way that the key card was used so to get was, in. Yeah. yeah. So the way he described it was not a bad plan. She just overdid things. Charlotte also confronts Strike again at another like meeting that they're having. He she like convinces him that she's going to bring someone who she doesn't. She's just trying to ask for him to come back. Yeah. Uh, so then we get Strike, who this whole time has just been sort of mopey, sleepy. <laughs> he's kind of, he's got like this frown of a mustache, and he always just has this resolute like I'm kind of sick of this face. I mean, he's the main character though, right? Yeah, but that's what I'm saying. It's like he doesn't have the endearing quality of like a house who's sometimes like super sarcastic. Like he's just like super serious all the time and kind of just glum. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. He's able to call things out because everybody has to be a genius when they're starring in a television <laughs> show. But at the same time, like he doesn't offer yeah, anything. Usually they make the characters somewhat lively or energetic. When yeah. He's not shows. energetic. And I, yeah, they're like, uh, run, run down the thing. I have a dead leg. I can't do that. <laughs> um, yeah. So then Robin gets a call while she's driving with strike. And she has a panic attack because the caller, I think it's Jimmy, or we're supposed to think it's Jimmy, is kind of saying, like, I know where you live. I'm going to come get you. Like, how dare you? Blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. And she, like, almost crashes the car. And she finally has to tell Strike what's up. Strike immediately responds with, like, hey, that's completely fine. I'm going to pay for your therapy through our for the, through the job. Like, you have to get this taken care of. And then they hug it out, and all's good between them. Um, and then Strike and Robin go to Kim's house after finding out that she actually hit Jasper on the head with a hammer once because he killed her pony. Um, <laughs> this is another dead horse in the books. I don't know if they actually, like, would have followed that same formula. But she ends up confiding that Jimmy and Billy's father knew Chisel... And his name was like, he, he was Mr. Knight, basically. And uh, he and Chisel would build these gallows, which are like torture devices. Yeah. The gallows, yeah. Um, and they were made illegal in Europe after a while, but they had a few left over. So they sold them because they make bank with them. And uh, they ignored the EU law. One of them was found in Zimbabwe and actually used to murder this person named Samuel Marape. And Marape is a name that's come up several times throughout the series. Uh, it feels like it was glossed over as a storyline, sort of, because we don't learn too much about it besides the fact that it had the Insignia, which was that horse that we've been seeing everywhere yeah. on the actual thing, because that was the brand that they had mm -hmm. at the time. And Kim thinks Jasper, of course, should have paid the night kids off, um, because that's what... It, but then she gets all fidgety and tells both Robin and Strike that her dog is on the loose or that she's gotten a text about it and that they should all go outside and look for the dog. Uh, Robin kind of spots that this is spotty behavior, asks to use the bathroom. She goes upstairs, finds a painting, and knows someone else is up there, but doesn't investigate further. She doesn't have time. Uh, when they get back to the hospital, they talk to Jimmy, or sorry, to Billy f for the first time since his stabbing and show him a picture of Raf with long hair as a kid and his pony. Um, and Billy's like, yeah, that's the girl and, and the uh, the pony. Um, and it turns out that Freddy strangled his brother Raph when they were kids, but he didn't die. And that was, that night, Freddy also killed Raph's horse. And that was the pony that was buried behind the cottage. Oh, okay, yeah, so it connected that way. Yeah, and so then he never actually witnessed a murder, this thing that's been haunting him throughout his whole life. Uh, Robin gets a text from Matt saying that he'll t say that Strike and her were having an affair during their relationship, which they weren't, but they probably could have been. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and then so she goes off to do that while Strike figures out that Raph was having an affair with the stepmom, Kim, and that their plan was to take the paint, or his plan was to get that painting, which was worth a ton more money than anybody knew, and kill her after a while once they'd gotten married. Yeah. So... Robin, then we find out, has gone to this houseboat, which I, The Fall has a houseboat, that TV show, The Fall. Mm -hmm. And this show, I, I guess it's more common in Britain than it is here, that people yeah, have houseboats. Yeah, just you that just they, go there, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so she gets there, and Raph is there, and this has all been a setup by him. And he's like, convince me I am truly fucked, and I'll turn myself in. Otherwise, I'm shooting your face. Mm -hmm. um, 
And I think that's actually a really smart way for a show to let the main character spoon feed the audience what the plot is yeah because they literally just say this is what we have on you <laughs> over and over and over again and it was it, it was a good trap so good way to um get me to fill in all the dots i hadn't yet and she explains how jasper had suspected them of having an affair raff and kim because he had found her pills which we saw earlier um in like episode one or two on the ground and that's why he had written raff out of the will to begin with And she followed that along by saying that Raph had actually been the people to contact Jimmy and his brother, telling them about the money that Chisel owed them. So he had been constructing this whole plot to begin with. And he, of course, was the nice guy earlier. So they didn't make it super obvious it was him. And I think it's because, a good testament to the book, that his character wasn't, didn't come across as evil. Um, So then Robin lies because she starts to get the impression that Raph is going to kill her, mm-hmm. uh, that he doesn't see that he's going to be truly like caught if yeah. he just runs. And she lies and tells him that his face was caught on the CCTV footage when he dressed up as the homeless person, <laughs> which so. it wasn't. He was under guise the entire time, like the towel but, covered but his does face. does he buy it? Yeah, he buys it immediately. He starts freaking out, and he's <laughs> it does a full 180, but then he's like, you know, it'll make me happy to kill you, so I still will. And that's when Strike jumps in, and he, like... Uh, punches through the door and uh stops him he's unloaded the gun already somehow because that was the same gun that kim had pulled on them the night before and uh then the cops are right behind them and we see him being taken off uh raf uh into like i guess just jail and uh after that billy seems to be mending he's no longer like drugged up or whatever and he is being his therapy is being paid for by the chisel family the izzy lady who seems to be the only good chisel out of all of them uh kim sort of breaks down when she realizes what raf was doing that she he had convinced her to kill her own husband to marry him and uh because he was going to then murder did, her did it feel convoluted <laughs> um by her character I just mean, like, kind of the story, because there's so many things going on. Like, I read that the Chisel family was a family that just backstabbed, like, each other, like, every step of the way. It honestly didn't feel too convoluted. Like, I watched it, and I was just, like, the beginning part, I guess, when Chisel hired uh, Strike to begin with, and we just got the thrown-in fact that Freddy was his kid, and Freddy was this evil guy. Unless we knew about Freddy from the first two seasons, which we might have, or first three seasons. We did then that that info was kind of just thrown in your face Mm. like i feel like there was a backstory there that was not expounded on that should have been because it kind of just was like you're supposed to know this yeah and uh some fans have expressed concerns that if they hadn't read the books they wouldn't know what was going on exactly well i did have to pay attention by the very end because they would it did do a good job of wrapping up almost all the conclusions the only thing or sorry all the questions Mm -hmm. um the only thing i'd say is that a lot of the undeveloped stuff like the person that he hired to track jimmy in that one scene they at the very end had a throwaway line of like yeah let's keep him on it's like okay i get you had to represent it because it was part of the book but it didn't really need its own like progression at all like there are things they could have cut but i feel like they kept and then they had to like cut down the amount of time it was actually worth because it's a 600 page book i'm glad they at least made it four episodes and didn't try to put it into three but at the same time i guess the most exciting part that chisel death could have happened i guess at the end end of episode one yeah like this is because i said there was five episodes in the first season but that was based off of two stories um so this is like a four episodes but it's based off of one story so they definitely did spread it out but due to television limitations entire characters were axed like allison who was uh the girlfriend of uh lula's brothers john and then uh lawyer cyprian may and his wife ursula these are all people from like uh the books that just weren't in here and then nico uh that's the name of one of the characters right her her actual name is kieran and uh, she was a she was very dialed back in the TV show as opposed to yeah. The book. If she's dialed back, I might not have mentioned her. Yeah, and then uh, apparently Tom Burke is uh, who he plays uh, the main. He's the character. main character. Yeah. Yeah, he's uh, taller and bulkier than Strike is supposed to be. For real, because it seemed like that's part of his character in the show. They literally mention it a few times. They're like, "You're you're a huge dude," and he doesn't come across that huge. Like I'm used to seeing 
Umbrella Academy, where yeah. you literally have that ape guy, yeah. like <laughs> who has ape DNA in him. Uh. Um, and and versus this, he just looked like a, I guess a bigger guy, but he didn't seem like I would be too offended off by him. Yeah, well, <laughs> was he intimidating? But I'm at 500 all? pounds. Was what? he intimidating at all? <laughs> Uh, no, not really. He again, he was kind of nice, but he was just so sleepy. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> he was very tired. What seemed like the entire episode. Another thing that's different from the television show in the books is that Lucy, who plays Strike's half sister, is more prominent in the books. She's only in one episode in the whole entire series, so that's uh, was it in strange. one of the episodes I saw. Uh, I yeah, I don't think so either. And then uh, they also cut a scene where Strike and Robin reunite at Strike's nephew's bedside, which is uh, Lucy's. Um, son's bedside because he got i think a crash he might have died so the end like i think tom burke was kind of saddened that they had to cut it because he found that part really good and effective. yeah i do know that that guy's active on twitter <laughs> just tom, tom burke <laughs> yeah like he he's one of the people who was like go out and watch the show the show just came out so i'm not meaning to go back on his character too much it's just the way that it's portrayed i, I he doesn't smile yeah <laughs> The, right. There yeah. has been, uh, the actors have gotten a lot of praise uh, as a 79% overall on Rotten Tomatoes. I'd say Robin probably did the best. Maybe she wasn't my favorite character in the first two episodes, especially when they showed her in the wedding. She was a little too, like, um, I don't want to get married mm -hmm. for this scene. Like, I was like, if you're in the wedding, at least actively participate. She, yeah. I think the first time she sees Strike, she's like, why didn't you call? And he's like, I did. And then she finds out that Matt had Matt, been deleting yeah. a lot of the text. And then she's like, Matt, we have to talk. And then the next scene, they're doing their first dance. And we never watched them talk. <laughs> so <laughs> so I, I didn't understand that either. It, it didn't kick off in the best of ways. But it ended the storyline with the murder in a way that I liked. Because Raph being the killer was not the first person you would expect. Kim being the killer, or at least helping the killer was almost the opposite of what you would expect because most of the time when you see someone so outrageously said everybody's like pointing the finger at them they're usually not the person right yeah so they made her sort of the person so i, I don't know uh, it, maybe i'm giving it too much credit um i thought as far as compared to harry potter there wasn't enough hagrid <laughs> <laughs> there wasn't the wizarding cap or whatever the one that puts you in the yeah it's, yeah. A, it's actually funny you say that because uh I, during the time of the season four release of this is when um jk rowling came out with what some people perceive to be transphobic tweets uh tweets and the harry potter cast kind of went after her for that but the person the who cast placed, but like yeah. daniel radcliffe yeah, was daniel just radcliffe, like Argh. emma watson and rupert grant and i think some other people um but the person who plays robin uh, her name being Holiday Granger kind of came out in support of uh, J.K. Rowling. Well, let's not dive into too much yeah, politics. No, I was just bringing it up because it happened through uh, throughout the show. Um, but the series has gone under some scrutiny for showing an episode in which a woman character, I think it was in season two, commits suicide, and that aired on World Suicide Prevention Day. So, huh? Yeah, the timing of it just seems like it was misplaced. But considering like what Thirteen Reasons Why. Does yeah, where, <laughs> where they're trying to like they do the opposite where they're like this is about suicide and then they kind of yeah, go overboard. Go over, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but the show has also done well with a viewership. Uh, I don't know if it's the same in the UK, but uh, season one got an average of 8.45 million viewers. Season two, 8.35 because they were back to back. Uh, season three was 8.08 .08 million viewers, and this season got around 7.3 million viewers. So. 7.3 total. Yeah. Well, average viewership. Like, every episode, though. Yeah, around there. That's really good. Yeah. So I'd never heard of this series before this season. I forgot to point out that the opener of the episode reminded me a lot of Bored to Death, that comedy show with Jason Schwartzman. And Zach Galifianakis, right? Yeah, and Ted Danson. Yeah, I know too much about that show. <laughs> but yeah, the beginning part is very retro and like film, like noir, I guess. And then there's like a singing lady in the back. It's yeah, like got the blurry film. I and this show I has been praised for its like retro feel and kind of cool aesthetic. Despite so. the fact that it exists in modern day like people are talking about their instagram people are showing that they, their phones all the time yeah. and using it for evidence like when robin goes upstairs and finds the person is there in the painting she's like clicking away on her on her camera and yeah. using that as evidence all the time which is smart uh it is it is a little funny that it all came down to just a painting's worth like that sounds like the backstory yeah. of a dick van dyke thing i but believe that the painting was called like mare morning it was yes so, yeah yeah and then the whole entire point of why the show and the book are called, it's called Louis the White is because um, of George Stubbs' artwork depicting a uh, mare morning of a pony that died of lethal white syndrome. 
Yeah, for a while I thought that it was going to be like a knife that had like a white background or something, but yeah, I just didn't know what it was. <laughs> yeah, the show hasn't been uh, renewed for a new season yet, um, and I believe that this one took about two years to make as opposed to the other ones, which I think premiered in 2016, 2017. Yeah, and that way it's like Sherlock. Yeah, so... So, like, but do, it, but are they actors doing other things? Are they becoming famous? Uh, I think so, but, like, the difference between this and Sherlock is the fact that Sherlock took two years for every season in between, but this one just took two years for this season. So mm-hmm. I wonder if that's because they were maybe writing out source material with the books or something, but I don't know. Yeah, well, you said the fifth one just got released, right? By yeah, JK? tomorrow. So. Tomorrow. And then also Tom Burke has just been cast as Marvel's new Doctor Stranger... String. No, <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, so we can leave it there unless you have anything else you no. want to add. Uh, it was an enjoyable show. I'd say the last two episodes are where the real meat is. And if you want to skip to those, then you're not going to understand a thing. But <laughs> have fun watching it. And uh, thanks for listening to today's episode. Bye. Bye.